your 1972 video vertical roll. So it's really a tour de force work and you worked with a technical flaw that the early television set had and that was the vertical roll. And the flaw meant that the TV image would slide down the screen, hit the bottom and bounce up. But you based your video uh, structure on that and you created this miraculous um, work where you choreographed a 20 minute action. You recorded it live using two cameras, but you worked with time, the present moment. You worked with space, especially videos, narrow depth of field that resembles a little theater and percussion. And you use the clacks as from no theater, I think. We practiced for two weeks. You know, and then the recording came after that period because it had to be perfect. The recording in that situation of the vertical roll, the way it was set up was um, Roberta, the camera woman was sitting in the middle of the room with a camera. And then that camera was connected to a monitor. Another camera was trained on the monitor. The monitor had the vertical roll going because you cannot record the vertical roll unless you record it off, you know, the image of the monitor. And so... I can, we continuously worked out this performance in the space of that gallery, which happened to be Robert Irwin's old studio. So in those days, I always describe it as it was hands-on. I could um, turn the knobs. I could do feedback in the monitor. I could do a lot. And, and my whole idea about working was, and I was always asking, what is peculiar to video? And so the vertical roll was one of those things that's peculiar to video. I did as much as I could with the setup, with the camera and the, and the projection, all in black and white. I did as much as I could with that s structure. And then I switched to storytelling and color. And I did something called the Juniper Tree, which was just an installation, but not a video at that time. As I was uh, working with color cameras, I started working with the idea, of also from the early days, the idea of the projection. And so that projection became a bigger and bigger backdrop for the performances and also the backdrop for the action in the recorded videos that one will see. So I just kept using, you know, going from one camera to another. I remember the first time I saw HD, I didn't like it at all. It was so, I thought it was so slick. And so, you know, compared to, we all loved that grainy, as you call it, the grainy, um, like very shallow space of the quarter pack. That was our aesthetic. Filmmakers hated it, but we liked it. So that there, so there's that transition from the very early technology. I believe sound has always been almost equal to the visual in your work. Um, you use words, you're reciting, like in Juniper Tree, um, it's your voice. Um, so how do you think about sound and the image? Well, I think in the beginning I used percussive mainly, like hitting blocks of wood together, like that, which I was influenced by the Japanese you know, drama. I visited Japan in 1970. That was the beginning of a long study of that form. I mean, I'd always had sound, um, this, the ambient sound that accompanied it, or simple as I said, hitting uh, stones together and so on. The sound grew more and more complex. Then sound in space, I suppose that was in an, a, a really, not exactly abstract, but a concrete studying sound delay. So in a piece called Song Delay, work I did outdoors, I started to work with the idea of the sound being delayed. You see it in the distance, and then the sound takes a second or two to get to you. So there's a, a, a lag. You just work with that and it interested me. And then I began to work with composers who wrote music for me. I wanna now get into how you've worked with the really brilliant pianist composer, Jason Moran. But I'd love to know how the connection with Jason started. I wanted to work with somebody I didn't know from outside my immediate cir circle. And so I was uh, showing at Yvonne Lambert and Adam Pendleton who always, always showed there who was a very young artist at the time, said he had been listening to Jason's music. And so I said, okay. 
And I looked in the newspaper and Jason was playing at the um, Lincoln Center that night. So I think Olivier and myself and Adam, we all went to the concert. Adam didn't know Jason, um, but we went to the concert and I liked it. So the next morning I called Jason on the telephone. He happened to be in the phone book. And I said, do you want to, would you like to work together? And he said, yes, I'll be right down. Basically, that's how we met. And the way Jason and I began was, I would set up the first scene with the projection and the words, and Jason would play something. And I would say yes or no. So it was like a trial and error. Jason would make up something and I would like it or it wouldn't be quite right. And we proceeded like that. And it was a pure joy to work with Jason, I have to say. Um, and I think it affected, of course, I know it affected both of us, our, our working together. Jessica Morgan, at the, when she spoke about your work, she said, you're an artist of space. And how does that make you feel? You smile, I think. Well, um, I like that, actually, because space was always a major consideration in my early work as well the issues of space. I mean, when you study art history, it's, you know, flat painting is about the space that, of that flat surface and how to alter it. And uh, I looked at Renaissance painting a lot because of the um, architecture, the use of architecture to make the space. And so when I began a performance, I'd always look at the space and relate the piece directly to the space. With Dia Beacon, that room that you see, that the piece is now installed in, we performed in the next room you know, in exactly, pretty much the same kind of space. So I love that space and I know it really well. That originally was shown at the ICA in Philadelphia, as is, as it is. Of course, it looked a little different because the space there is so different from the Dia Beacon space with the columns. So that's one piece made out of elements from a period of work in which I used paper walls to define a space and a, and a hoop over, and, some of my props I use over and over again, a hoop, and bars and other elements, chairs that were in organic honey. The cones are from also those works from earlier time. Then the shape descent is a much more complicated piece in one part of the space. I have to tell you, I really loved doing this installation. It was so, that it's, I think it's one of my, the most pleasurable parts of working is this final step of putting it someplace and, and being able to do it in the way that you want to do it. I'd love to know about your collaboration with scientists. And I think you did for the 2019 Venice Biennial. It was the beginning of me being concerned and working, not just as landscape and the beauty of landscape, but the actual, what is happening in the environment. So in the Venice Biennale, I had a room devoted to fish, one to bees, and then one to wind and then to children, and I wanted the presence of children. I didn't have to say it verbally, but just having children in that situation for me said something without me having to explain it. I never worked with a scientist until my piece based on the oceans, you know, for TBA 21, which was also shown in Venice. And I worked with the scientist, David Gruber. But basically I was interested in him because he, his work is about how fish perceive. And so he makes uh, cameras and lenses. And my work is about perception too. So I, I thought we'd come together on that level. The first question is um, from Deborah, who, who asks, what is Joan's intention towards her audience? I step in and out of the work continuously when I'm working on it and look at it to see what the audience will see. It's a frontal. I mean, when I do a performance, it's a frontal situation. And I also never interact with the audience. So there's a kind of distance in that way. So I want the audience to understand what I'm trying to say. I try to make it as clear as possible. And um, I want to attract the audience mm -hmm. to see it. How did you come to performance as a concept while working in video art? When I saw the work of dancers and artists in New York in the 60s, you know, Lucinda Childs, Yvonne Rainer, Simone Forti, and Klaus Oldenburg. In particular, you could say Klaus's work really influenced me. I could see how a visual artist could make an environment and then do a performance in it in relation to that situation. Klaus, I remember he had a storefront on the Lower East Side. 
and you walked through room by room, there was somebody in each room performing and uh, in relation to his props and objects. So that really, when I saw that, I thought it was, it drew me. And it, I, I wasn't happy with my sculpture, so-called sculpture. And so I saw that this other form I could operate in and I could, you know, I would have the, I could include music and props, as you say, and objects and so on. And that's how I stepped from sculpture to live performance. The video was also connected to the now. You could see a live image. You didn't have to wait for it to go to a lab to be developed. So it had this immediacy. When artists had a video camera in their loft, in their studio, and they could see themselves simultaneously with the recording, that was a major moment. It's, it's, I think it's hard for all of you uh, young folks to know because you all have, you know, just it's your everyday uh, accompaniment, but we didn't. And so that was just a, a big moment when that happened. particular fascination of mine is that um, period of early video art um, where people were coming to the medium for the first time and uh, using the materiality, like, I guess, misusing the materiality of it because people didn't necessarily approach this medium from a technical point of view. It was more from a, a kind of, well, what can we do with it? Well, yes, um, but I, we did approach it from the technical point of view. Mm -hmm. The technology of video had a, played a large part in, in everything, in, in, in what I did, for sure, and mm -hmm. what other people did. You know, the whole use of the, the idea that, that it was a tape. Yeah. Some, one person I didn't do, you know, made a piece where the tape played in a large area. So it took time for the image to go around. Do you remember Barbara? Uh -huh. with, oh yeah, and Nam June did that. Yeah. Nam June did that in the machine as seen at the end of the mechanical age. She took two um, open reel tape players and ran the Lindsay tape. Yeah, it went really all over the place. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. And I, I remember I made a piece at in television workshop where I had a picture and a picture. I mean, you could do all these things and you could make the narrative more complicated and so on. But I'd say that we were, I would call, say that we were, that the technology was um, altering our way of doing things. And of course, back then, what the portable camera, early Portapack meant was instead of television being the only one with this technology, now this consumer equipment, although it was crude, was in the hands of the ordinary person and of course, artists. So. And then, of course, figuring out what it could do, like what Beryl Karat did was she created a proscenium by putting four monitors embedded in a wall and then very carefully wove this imagery across so that you had a very beautiful right. composition. I mean, this is just typical. There was one store down a little bit south of Soho and Canal Street, and there was a guy named C.T. Louis who knew everything about technology. And you'd go into a store and you'd see people's cameras and their portabacks all taken apart on tables, you know, little pieces, because they were fixing them. He had a projector, which I borrowed. And he, um, when I did the performances at um, Lo Giudici, my first video, Organic Honey, the very first Organic they, we had a projector. So I was very lucky. And it kept breaking down, of course, and he, C.T. Louis would have to come and fix it. I mean, that's the difference of those days and now. You mentioned that all of your work is about perception on a certain level. And, and I think those early works, we're, we're working with a different kind of perception that is uh, coming out of the, the question of, of the materiality of video. What can we learn from these more recent works in, in relation to the need for different kinds of perception? Somebody came up to me like maybe 10 years ago at a performance in Italy and said, you used to always look in now you're looking out, and it's true. 